Hello and welcome. I'm Siobhan Sarna here with Dr. Allison Seebecker of SIBOinfo.com fame and award-winning practitioner and SIBO specialist and the incredible and one and only Dr. Mark Pimentel. I feel like Oprah right this second. You get a car, you get a mark, you get a mark. Sorry, I'm super jazzed as you can tell. Um, Dr. Pimentel, who is head of the Pimentel Labs, the mass program Cedar sinai He is the one, no pressure mark, who I believe who deserves Nobel Peace Prizes, um, Pulitzer Prizes, um, you name it. I think he's going to be the one who cures us of this condition, small intestine bacterial overgrowth, IMO. I don't care what you call it. Just call me and let me know how it's going. So <laughs> Dr. Pimentel, where you're coming to us live right now from LA. Tell us about your background. What are we looking at? Oh, this is the uh, new mass program behind us. Uh, all the new fancy sciencey looking stuff. If you look way back there, that square window is where the lab is. We have about 8,000 square feet with all the sequencing equipment and everybody. And I sort of told people to sort of shy away, but they're, they're, they'll walk around back there. So just let them do their great work. Do their thing. We're sending good vibes. By the way, did I introduce myself? Hi, I'm Siobhan Sarna, founder of SIBO SOS and author of Healing SIBO. And it's such a pleasure to have everyone join us. I did stream it um, last minute into our Facebook group, SIBO SOS community, because we overflowed the Zoom cutoff of 3,000 registrants. And the whole point is to get the word out. So share this with your family and friends, your fellow gut sufferers. And I do want to adjust one expectation. We have been barraged with questions. And today it's really about listening to Dr. Pimentel. So I'm not going to be taking live questions. I beg you not to hate me, but this is a rare opportunity to hear from uh, the doctor himself. So I'm going to let you take it away, Dr. Pimentel. And um, Dr. Seebecker and I will hide ourselves on camera. And as will Clarissa behind the scenes, if anyone has any tech problems, please reach out in chat. That is exclusively for that. We will not be monitoring, monitoring the chat or the Q&A for anything else. If we have any naughty people here, which I doubt, be nice or be gone. So here we go. Thanks, Dr. Pimentel, for being here. Oh, thank you so much. And happy Valentine's Day, everybody. Um, so, you know, I was asked to sort of give an update, but also some of these slides I, I use repeatedly because things, some things don't change, some things change. But there are a lot of new slides because in 2022 already there's some really fascinating information but i'll try to put context or color around each slide so that you can understand why SIBO is the way it is and and we call it the new new SIBO because SIBO continues to change and new things are being added and uh, and not to forget emo intestinal methanogen overgrowth for those of you who tune into a SIBO cast and don't know what SIBO is, it's small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, but I assume you all know. Um, so I always show this slide because I think this is now pretty grounded. Uh, you know, what we think is happening is that food poisoning on the, on the far left, acute gastroenteritis here, any of these four organisms can be the start, the trigger. You were fine until, boom, you had food poisoning. And, and for, for some of you, the listeners, one of the challenges we have is that, oh, I don't remember food poisoning. Well, yeah, you may not, because 10 years ago, it could have been two days of diarrhea with E. coli after eating some, at some restaurant, but it wasn't so memorable. But then that's what triggered the whole thing. So you, you don't always have to remember the food poisoning for it to be the cause. But the sicker you are with food poisoning, the more likely you are to develop IBS. And then you follow this pattern of this toxin causes autoimmunity to the nerves of your gut, leading to the gut not working well, and then you get bacterial overgrowth. And what I've got under here is all the proof that I'm going to show you during this presentation of how this all happens and how IBS becomes an antibiotic sensitive disease and how SIBO develops. But I won't just talk about IBS and SIBO, I will broaden it a bit. But what is small intestinal bacterial overgrowth? Which, well, I, I, I wish when I prepared this slot, this one slide, the way it stands currently, a number of years ago, uh, you know, SIBO is not exactly SIBO as it was in 2017 or even 2016, but we'll get into that. But essentially the large intestine contains a tremendous amount of bacteria per gram weight of stool. In fact, half of the material in the colon is actually uh, bacteria. 
But, but what I'm saying now is in a little bit different context, even though there's so much bacteria in the colon, the bacteria is only on the outside of the stool are you seeing or is it rubbing or touching the surface of the colon and interacting with you. So even though there's a tremendous amount of bacteria, it isn't really affecting you so much. The small intestine contains a lot lower amount concentration of bacteria, but it's spread over 15 feet of bowel that if you laid it out flat and stretched out the villi, those little hairs that absorb food, it's the area of a tennis court. So imagine if you increase the bacteria to in, in, in the area of a tennis court, it's like spreading a thin um, layer of peanut butter over a tennis court. That's a lot of peanut butter. But the small intestine shouldn't contain more than 1,000 bacteria per gram or per milliliter of material, whereas the, the stool, of course, contains a tremendous amount. But before we get into sort of this IBS connection, because this is a lot of the thrust of our work, SIBO occurs in an instance in which the small bowel does not clean itself or clear itself properly. So anything that causes a small intestine not to move, not to drain, not to, to flow fast, because the, the way the gut works is food, you eat it, sits in the stomach for about two hours, then it's gone, sits in the small intestine for about five or six hours max, then it's gone and it's in the colon for 24 hours or longer. So obviously more time, more bacteria because you have more time for the bacteria to grow. So we call the small intestine a relatively fast flowing organ. Plus it, can, it has a lot of fluid, so it kind of washes through. So you shouldn't have too much bacteria there. Of course, scar tissue adhesions. If you're taking narcotics, which paralyze in part the small intestine, you can get overgrowth diabetes, especially if you've had it for a long time, and many other things. But when we talk about SIBO, we often equate it to IBS because that's really the big chunk of the pie. Uh, irritable bowel syndrome affects 1 billion people worldwide, and I'll talk about what proportion of IBS could be SIBO as there's more and more data accumulating. But what we think based on culture, and I'll show you that data in a moment, is that uh, 60% of IBS could be SIBO based on culture. Um, now, compare that to H. pylori and ulcer disease. H. pylori is, a, is a, an important bacteria that we now know causes ulcers. And this is if you take aspirin and Advil out of the equation, if you left it in, it would be 60%. If you take it out, it's about 73%. So it's not too uh, dissimilar, these two concepts, that a bacteria or a group of bacteria in the case of SIBO is contributing to a very large chunk of irritable bowel syndrome. Dr. Pimentel, what was that with the um, the ibuprofen thing? What is that? So ibuprofen is an NSAID. Uh, any of those pro those aspirin is an NSAID, and they can cause ulcers. So this oh, is if you, if you took okay. those out, if you put them back in, in other words, anybody with an ulcer, it's about 60% which means that H. pylori and SIBO are almost exactly the same story in that, um, you know, if you just looked at an ulcer and you saw an ulcer, about 60% of people with an ulcer would have H. pylori. And that's what we're seeing with IBS. Thank you. So then there's the types of IBS. So you have constipation, you have mix, you have diarrhea types. And so how does bacteria cause all these different flavors and we now think that IBS is really sort of two flavors of, of microbe or bacterial disruption. One is the IBS D and mixed, and the other is the constipation. But this group is going to get broken down, and, and I'll show you a little bit about hydrogen sulfide. But as we move towards later in this year, as things start to get published, this group's going to break into two pieces, potentially, and, and you'll start to see that. But it all boils down to, well, how do I know if I have SIBO? Well, you have to do some kind of test. You could do an invasive test and get a, get a sample from the small intestine. But even that's tricky because they, they don't have the right kind of catheters. We have a, a catheter that we develop. It's not used in clinical practice. It's only for research purposes to get it properly and sterilely, uh, the juice from the small bowel. But a breath test is a simple, uh, way of doing it without, without um, 
you know, without an invasive procedure is what I mean. But you drink a sugar and then it gets into your stomach, gets into the small intestine. And then after that, the bacteria of the small intestine produce these gases that humans don't produce. It goes into your lungs and we measure it in your breath. So for, and Allison remembers this and Siobhan as well, back in the early days of SIBO, wow, breath testing causes IBS or a SIBO causes IBS. Well, no, I thought we thought IBS was a disease of depression and anxiety and, and whether stress caused IBS. We now know that that's not, that's not true. Uh, there is no level one study that says stress causes IBS. Stress makes lots of things worse, including bowel function. So it's a modifier, but it's not stress. But imagine the early days of this where we were saying, oh, bacteria cause IBS, when everybody else in the past thought stress and anxiety were the contributors. It was, a, it was controversial. But now fast forward to 2020, there's 25 studies Without a doubt, SIBO by breath test is more often positive in irritable bowel syndrome. And so this is full stop. We now know this to be true. This just came out from scientific reports. And, and this is an important finding because if you just did a good study on, on, on irritable bowel syndrome, what proportion of patients would be positive on a breath test? Well, of course it varies and, and those who are more uh, used to seeing these types of patients, like including us, we're seeing higher rates. But in the general usage of breath testing, it is very typical to be about 49-50% of patients positive. So one of the concerns is that there are some people who get much higher results. Now, either they're real experts and they get a referral practice, sort of like us, where they get more of those types of patients. But if it's too high, you got to be concerned. But we're seeing on average, 50% of IBS is SIBO based on breath tests from this meta-analysis. The point of this is not what percent you're going to have in your practice or a doctor will have in their practice. The point of this is SIBO is a big part of IBS. It, it, it's at least 50%, and by culture, it's 60%. So, so the point is SIBO and IBS are inter, intermixed, and we think SIBO is causing IBS. So these are the gases we measure on breath test. Hydrogen is one of them. In fact, that was the original gas from the first breath test started in the 1970s and 80s. Hydrogen is not produced by humans. So if you find hydrogen in the breath, it's coming from bacteria somewhere in your body. And in this case, we now know it's the gut. But that's the simple part of the story. It is not simple because hydrogen really doesn't do much. Yes, it's a marker for overgrowth. Yes, you can diagnose overgrowth, but you could have a, a 200 parts per million of hydrogen on your breath or 30 and you still have SIBO and the 200 patient is not worse than the 30 because hydrogen is being used. It's, it's a fuel for other organisms, methane producers, for example, and they take four of these, four of these hydrogens to make one methane. And then hydrogen sulfide producers take five to make one hydrogen sulfide. And those are the other two big gases. Here's the problem. Breath testing up until the last year and a half only measured hydrogen and then methane. And only in the last year and a half can we measure all three at the same time. If you don't measure all three, you're missing the whole story. And, and you'll see more papers come out this year by us that tells you why it's so important to measure all three. And the whole story is much bigger than just hydrogen and methane. But before I run off that topic, you've got small bowel culture. This is the, these are the culture studies, and this is not breath tests anymore. Even in this culture study back in 2007, 43% of IBS had SIBO. In this study in, in 2012, using the uh, 1,000 bacteria cutoff, this is the 60% that I told you about earlier. So if you have IBS with diarrhea, there's a 60% chance SIBO could be causing your symptoms. And so it's super important to know, look, and then treat because you could be treating a causative factor in IBS. But now where the work is heading is, look, it's one thing to say you have SIBO. It's another thing to say, well, we can try these treatments. It's an even greater thing to say, we know who it is, we know where you live and we're going after you. 
Uh, and that's where we've been for the last six years. We now know it's E. coli and it's Klebsiella. And I'll show you later, we now know where they live and some of the drugs weren't getting there as well as we'd like. And so that's where we're developing new programs for treatment that are hopefully going to do much better. Another culture study, this is from Australia. We love Australia. So anybody from Australia out there? Um, this shows again, this is functional GI disorders. So that's what FGID stands for. But the majority of those patients were IBS, some were dyspepsia patients. It doesn't matter. Both groups have higher bacteria in their small intestine. The, the argument I'm trying to make is the evidence is pretty overwhelming at this point that SIBO and IBS are intertwined, whether you look at breath tests, whether you look at culture, and I'll show you in a minute, the most sophisticated deep sequencing of the small intestine, same thing, same result. So now we get into that sophisticated stuff. This is the reimagined study. What we hoped, hoped to do and are seeing that the fruits uh, of our labor uh, starting now is that the reimagined study was where we where we should be looking for the microbiome we think is the small intestine it's that peanut butter spread across a tennis court that's the surface area of the small intestine that's the absorbing surface of the gut imagine what the bacteria can do to you if they're wrong there and and so we're looking at various diseases obesity of course SIBO uh various other conditions even autoimmune diseases and stay tuned for some of those uh, interesting results are already emerging from our, our lab and, and you'll start to hear that um, in the medical press soon. But back to focusing on SIBO, the reimagined study helped us even further define SIBO. This is a SIBO patient. This is a patient with cultures showing SIBO of the small bowel, it's not just breath test. And this is a non SIBO patient. And right away you see this orange bar is much bigger here than here. That's proteobacteria, which when you boil it down is Klebsiella and this gray bar E. coli. Where is Klebsiella E. coli here? This little tiny sliver and this sliver is nothing. So SIBO is all about Klebsiella and E. coli. We're getting down to who the, who the bad players are here. I know this is a complicated slide, but it, these the evidence for all of this needs to be built because Critics have come along and says, well, yeah, okay, so breath testing, but breath testing is not that great. Then you do culture and they say, okay, well, you did culture, but maybe the breath test is showing you that the lactulose sugar is getting to the colon and that's where the hydrogen's coming from. And, and therefore the breath test is not good. Well, that's not true either. So here is, uh, we did sort of a met metabolic function of the juice of the small intestine. And what we see is that the breath test correlates, that's hydrogen on the breath test, correlates with all the mechanisms and enzymes that bacteria have to produce hydrogen in the small intestine. So the juice in the intestine has the gears to make hydrogen, and that correlates with the fact that, yeah, you have hydrogen on your breath test. And the point of that is the hydrogen's not coming from the colon, it's coming from the small intestine, full stop. So that argument is done. But there's a couple of sort of very complicated, but not really, uh, sort of elegant diagrams. This is what your microbiome network looks like in the small intestine. So think of it like Los Angeles. You have a city, you have plumbers, doctors, lawyers, uh, sanitation workers, you name it, in harmony, in the right amount of each, so that everybody makes enough to live and it's a harmonious situation. That's what normal looks like. So everybody is of relatively equal proportions and they all interrelate very harmoniously. I put two circles. One is E. coli, the other is Klebsiella. Maybe the, remember the two, two characters I don't like, the ones that are causing SIBO? They're nice and balanced with everything else. But look what happens in SIBO. Look what happens to the harmony, it's gone. This is E. coli now, E. coli's up, Klebsiella's up, and they just destroy the rest of the microbiome. There's less, they're, they're, they're less cohesive, they're less interactive, and there's bad actors adding, adding on top of it. So this is what happens in SIBO. This is what your microbiome looks like if you have that condition. 
we work a, a little bit with Rustam Ismagalov from, from Caltech, and he proposes this microbial hysteresis. So the E. coli is the bad disruptor, and it goes up and up and up, and it's fine. There is some, you know, your gut is able to handle a little bit of E. coli and a little more E. coli and a little more E. coli until you reach a tipping point, and then it flips. And when it flips, you're in an unhealthy state like you saw in that last picture. Um, little complicated slide, but the point I'm trying to make here is that somebody said, well, you know, you keep saying that adhesions cause SIBO, but I can't find a paper. This paper literally just came out in 2021. They created sort of an adhesion model in an animal, but there's two points to make here. If you have adhesions in an animal, you get SIBO. Okay, that's, that settles it, that it's true. But the second thing is when they got SIBO, again, it's E. coli, Escherichia coli. That's the genus that's going up. And, and it's similar to what we're seeing in IBS. Okay, so now let's talk a little bit about this methane thing or intestinal methanogen overgrowth. Now people say, well, why did you break SIBO into SIBO and EMO? Because methanogens are not bacteria. So the B in SIBO bacteria doesn't fit. Secondly, methanogens live in the colon and the small intestine, and they can be elevated in the colon in an abnormal way, causing symptoms. So the small intestine part of SIBO also doesn't fit. So we had to create a new term called intestinal methanogen overgrowth, and, and that's where we stand. So things are going to change on this slide a lot because we've learned things in the last few weeks that change this slide but as of now I can't because we haven't published it yet but you'll hear about it in probably the next two to three months because the actor that's producing hydrogen for methanogens I thought it was E. coli yes E. coli produces hydrogen but in this situation it's not this one that's all I can tell you for now and you'll have to wait to hear more but we figured out who the characters are that are feeding this this M. smithii. M. smithii is the methane producer. It is an archaea. It's not bacteria, and it produces methane. And when you, the more methane you have, the more constipated and bloated you become. And so this is really important. So this is a meta analysis of methane and constipation, and clearly methane causes constipation by breath test. Now, I wanted to put this in in sort of like a summary of sort of what we've talked about so far, but you have to think about it in a different way. Think about it in the year 1999 when we were first publishing our papers on this way back then when IBS was thought of as a psychological condition. And even up until the last few years, there was still some, well, could it be, could it be, could it be SIBO? And now we've got one of the world experts in IBS publishing a paper just last year saying, yep, a subset of patients with diarrhea predominant IBS have small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Yes, meth methanogens, these bugs that produce methane are associated with constipation and can be treated with antibiotics. And yes, antibiotics can be effective. And they talk about diets and other things, including rifaximin. So, Things have changed dramatically in 20 years, but it took a lot of work. Um, but the new kid on the block, so this is now going past all of this, is hydrogen sulfide. Now, one of the characters for, for producing hydrogen sulfide we now know is Fusobacterium, and Varium is one of the species. But there are others, like Desulfovibrio and others, which are beyond the, the, the purpose of this talk. But when they use hydrogen to produce hydrogen sulfide, we now know that's the reason you have diarrhea, urgency, and pain, not the hydrogen. It's this. So if you don't see this, you don't know everything about the patient's breath test. So we wanted to, for many years, add hydrogen sulfide to the breath test. Here's the problem. Hydrogen sulfide is very reactive, not stable. And so you have to keep it in a container that is rated for holding hydrogen sulfide, hydrogen, and methane for periods of time so that you can send it to a lab and have it measured. And so that had to be worked on, and, and we've solved that problem. Hydrogen sulfide also needs special sensors, but not just a special sensor for hydrogen sulfide. You have to have hydrogen sulfide, hydrogen, and methane all in the same instrument 
measuring the gases simultaneously without cross-reading other gases. Uh, so maybe the hydrogen and hydrogen sulfide would be read as hydrogen a little bit on the hydrogen sensor. And if it is, you have to adjust for that. So there's a lot of technical difficulties. And then you have to do the clinical trials for that instrument, for that bag system, to make sure that it correlates with the human symptoms. And we did that. Initially, the cutoff was five. And now the new cutoff is, is three. But it's for a reason. And I'll show you why in the, in, in the next slide. But looking at the test compared to old tests, the new test is exactly the same as the old test for hydrogen and methane maybe a bit more specific because this the new sensors in the new test are within 0 0.1 parts per million and in the old tests it's plus or minus two so the error is two parts per million that can be important if you're hovering around 19 20 being the cutoff because if you're 19 maybe it's really 21 if it's 21 maybe it's really 19 and that's the difference between a positive and a negative test so having a more accurate more precise measurement can be important so the first look at these data was that, okay, let's take like real diarrhea patients, like flat out diarrhea. And sure enough, anything over five, really this was the diarrhea group. But we've since looked at a group of IBSD patients and they're down here because they're not as severe diarrhea and more than three is the good cutoff for them. So three is the new cutoff. But this is a hard, figure to sort of understand, but the point of this figure is with methane, the more methane you have, the more constipation you have. With hydrogen sulfide, the more hydrogen sulfide you have, the more diarrhea you have. And so, whereas with hydrogen, it doesn't matter. High hydrogen, low hydrogen, it just is there or not. So that's why these two gases are like the thermometers of your, of your symptoms. Whereas hydrogen is just the fuel for these other two thermometers. It's, it's just important to have all three gases. Cool study, we presented this last year. This basically proves that this bug, Fusobacterium varium, we put it into the rats. The rats here produce more hydrogen sulfide. And because they produce more hydrogen sulfide, they got more diarrhea. And when the bug cleared out, the diarrhea went away. That's it. Simple as that. This bug, hydrogen sulfide, means diarrhea. So how do we treat SIBO? And this is, is really important, is we got to transition from all this great science to, well, how do we make it better? Well, this was a study looking at rifaximin. Rifaximin was, was conceived on the notion that IBS was a microbiome disease. Uh, we didn't have as much of the details we do now that have been filled in. But rifaximin has been the best drug ever for irritable bowel syndrome with diarrhea in terms of you take it for only two weeks and you can get months of benefit. And that's what we, we saw. This is just the initial studies showing everything got better. Everything to the right of this line means statistical significance. So it didn't matter what you looked at, pretty much the patients were better and it lasted for up to three months. But since then, we, we did another study in, in terms of rifaximin showing that, okay, so if you took rifaximin and you had no idea, 44% of people would respond to rifaximin using a very difficult FDA endpoint. But look what happens if you add the breath test. If your breath test is negative before you take rifaximin, you still can respond, a quarter of people, but much less. But if the breath test was positive, 56% of people respond a lot higher and 76% of people are responders if that breath test was positive and rifaximin made it negative. So it speaks to the importance of the breath test. It speaks to the importance of identifying SIBO and being able to know who's responding because if that breath test doesn't become negative, that patient won't respond and that's the point. Now methane is a different animal. It's not a bacteria, it's an archaea. And an archaea are ancient organisms. We didn't design antibiotics for archaea. It happens that some of these antibiotics do have some effect, but you need more than one antibiotic to get it done. In this study, you're, these are constipated patients. And of course, they're constipated because they have methane. And we gave them neomycin. This is an antibiotic with placebo. Not so great. Still almost 60% of people still have, sorry, this is the constipation score, still a pretty high score for constipation. 
but the score is much lower if they got the neomycin plus rifaximin, and that's what we do traditionally with uh, with C with emo intestinal methanogen overgrowth. Hot off the press, um, people wanted to know well, how long do you have to take these antibiotics for the methane to go down? The methane starts to go down by about day six, but it really is nine ten days before it really goes down to that less than ten mark. And so we generally recommend 14 days because it, you need the full 14 for methane to go down. The other thing in this paper that just came out is we really show that even though we weren't necessarily uh, in the North American consensus agreeing with 10 part per million, 10 really is the widest spread. Um, the constipation score is much higher if you have 10 parts per million and less so if it's five parts per million. So it's it's important to, um, 10 parts per million probably is a, a better cutoff for identifying methane or methane relevant methane. Hydrogen sulfide is the new kid. So we don't have a lot of randomized control trials or, or treatment data yet. But what we do know from as early as 1998, if you take Pepto-Bismol is the sort of the, the, the marketing name for bismuth. Uh, with your antibiotic, you can really reduce hydrogen sulfide. And that's what we're doing in clinic, but we're waiting for some clinical trials that are coming right now on some new products that are really hopeful uh, for treating all of the above actually, but especially hydrogen sulfide. So in the last segment, I'm gonna spend just a few minutes switching gears and saying, okay, you have SIBO, you have IBS, but how the heck did this start? Why, why do I have this? Uh, am I, is it my genetics? Is it, you know, something I did? Is it, what, what's going on? And we now know, this is a Mayo Clinic study from 2017. It probably, they'll probably do another study coming up, but this is 45 clinical trials in this study. One in nine period people who got food poisoning now have IBS. So we now know food poisoning causes IBS, full stop. And that's what we've been working on for now about 15, 16 years with our animal models because what we eventually want to do is not to treat SIBO with antibiotics. That's the short-term game because we want to help people get better now. But the long-term game is why is this happening? What's the driver? And can we cure IBS and SIBO? by getting to the root. And that's, that's really what our focus is on in the lab also. This is an animal study. We basically gave these rats Campylobacter, Campylobacter food poisoning. But, and after food poisoning, 27% of the rats developed IBS. A lot more than humans. Humans were one in nine. This is one in four, but we gave them a good amount of Campylobacter, a large amount. So we're, we're pushing the limits and we're getting 27%. But the point is food poisoning causes SIBO, um, which we know is associated with IBS. Not just that, if the rats got the Campylobacter, which is C positive and got SIBO, those rats also had altered bowel function. So they got IBS like symptoms. They also had a little bit of elevated white blood cells, the lymphocytes in the rectum when, they, when we did biopsies. That is also what's seen in humans. Why am I showing you all this really hardcore data? Because the animal studies we now, and animal models we now have are identical to what happens in humans who develop post, what we call post-infectious IBS, and they develop SIBO. And so that's putting the two things together. I'm fast forwarding probably 20 studies but it all comes down to this toxin, cytolethal distending toxin B, CDTB. Campylobacter has it, E. coli has it, Salmonella has it, and Shigella has it. It's the only toxin they have in common. We then took that toxin, purified it, and gave it like a vaccine to rats. So all the rats saw were this toxin. They didn't get food poisoning. They just got the toxin. But guess what? The rats got SIBO. I'll show you. First of all, they develop antibodies to this toxin. That's expected because we're injecting the toxin, <clears throat> but they developed antibodies to themselves, vinculin, which is a protein in their nerves of their gut. So getting this toxin <clears throat> meant that they got antibodies to themselves. That's called an autoimmune disease. So this toxin causes an autoimmune disease 
to the gut nerves. Focus on this side. This bar is down here. This bar is up here. The rats who got this toxin now have SIBO, both in the duodenum and the last part of the small bowel. This line is higher than this line statistically. They got SIBO. So this toxin all by itself causes SIBO. Just a little education on vinculin. This green lines here are the skeleton that holds your cell in shape, especially nerve cells. And this red, or the, you can see it better here, these red tufts are vinculin. And they are like a little motor at the end of these lines, the green lines, that cause the cell to reach out and grab onto the next nerve cell so that the nerves are all connected. Mm -hmm. And when you disrupt that, the nerves get disconnected. So the way now we think IBS is working is you get exposed to this toxin and then you develop antibodies and the antibodies don't like this part, don't like this part, don't like this part, but this part looks a little like vinculin and you get autoimmunity and that's called molecular mimicry. This toxin is mimicking vinculin on purpose so that you develop this immunity to yourself and then you cause this damage but it helped us develop a blood test for IBS. And it tell this blood test, look, I mean, if you look here, this is IBS in red. This is the CDTB antibody in your blood way higher than in Crohn's or ulcerative colitis or other conditions of diarrhea. Same for vinculin. But if you're positive on both blood markers, 98% chance you have IBS. You do not have to do other tests potentially specificity is over 90 percent and this is really really sort of the important parts of this test so this is the sequence we're coming down to the last few slides you have food poisoning you get exposed to this toxin it can create autoimmunity that autoimmunity damages the nerves of the gut that damage to the nerves of the gut means the gut doesn't flow correctly remember not flowing enough bacterial overgrowth. Sure enough, that's what happens in the animals and that's what's happening in humans. And then IBS becomes an antibiotic responsive condition. This just got published. So excited to put the, the citation at the bottom, but this shows the whole thing I've been telling you about. You have this beautiful bacterial colonization of the gut, all the different colors, so many different types of bacteria, all living in harmony, the nerves of the gut, everything's intact, the gut flows correctly. Then this invader, Campylobacter in this case, produces this, comes in, causes food poisoning. You, it produces a toxin that you get exposed to, and then you produce antibodies to this toxin here. And you can see the antibodies to CDTB go up first, and it takes about three months for this antivinculin to start. When the antivinculin starts, you start to get a breakdown in some of the nerves, and then you get poor flow, and then you get a buildup of these blue guys which are the E. coli and Klebsiella. That's how SIBO happens right here on this slide. So how do I do this? How do I do this in practice? How do I use the tests? What do I do to try and treat patients? So based on all this evidence, so if you have a patient with chronic diarrhea, I'm not saying IBS here, I'm saying chronic diarrhea, I wanna know, chances are they have IBS because that's the highest likelihood, but let's figure it out more precisely. If you have anti-CDTB and anti-vinculin positive, you have IBS. I'll do the three gas breath test also. So if you're positive, more than 90% specificity, this is irritable bowel syndrome. Well, you say, but, well, maybe I just do the gas breath test because the gas breath test tells me how to treat. Yeah, but if you know it's food poisoning, I can tell you you're more likely to get food poisoning again because of the nerve damage. So I want my patients to know because when they travel, they take more precautions. They're aware of what caused everything for them. Now, if it's negative and the breath test is negative, you need to think about what's going on because something else is going on. But if the three gas breath test hydrogen is positive, then I'm giving rifaximin. Now with the new hydrogen sulfide, I'm giving rifaximin with bismuth. We're waiting for some really interesting double blind studies to, to be uh, a available for, for public uh, scrutiny uh, that will show some really interesting results with hydrogen sulfide. But for now, this is what we're doing. Mixed and mixed constipation diarrhea, I do the same thing. For the chronic constipation, you could either do the three gas if that's convenient or two gas because you have to focus on methane here. 
If your methane's positive, we give her Faximin plus Neomycin. If methane's negative, think about what else is going on because something else could be going on. And then you can substitute Neomycin for metronidazole if you're worried about Neomycin and some of its side effects. So here's the proof of SIBO and IBS, and this is my last slide. Proof of SIBO, here's IBS, here's SIBO. What we know is there's 25 studies that prove that breath testing is important in IBS. What we know is there are four studies proving SIBO and IBS by culture and 60% of IBSD is SIBO. What we know is breath testing now is validated by sequencing and culture using specialized protected catheters. What we know is hydrogen on breath test is produced in the small bowel, and this is based on metabolomics. Antibiotics make IBS better. And so we know this story is pretty complete and we're just trying to further it with the emo and the hydrogen sulfide. And improvements in IBS depend on antibiotics. So in conclusion, IBS is commonly a small bowel microbiome disease. SIBO is an important contributor to IBS. These are the bugs, these are the bad actors that really cause a disruption in your bowel, E. coli and Klebsiella. Methane is associated with constipation, that's now clear. Hydrogen sulfide is becoming clearer and clearer by the day as the missing link in diarrhea that we couldn't figure out before. Reducing methane makes constipation better. We need better treatments. So now that we understand the microbiome better and where these bugs live, we are already doing better. And you'll hear more about that in the coming months. And then autoimmunity is super important to all of this. So, you know, the CDTB and the vinculin and the antibodies to these are helping us unravel the true root cause. Now, treatments for these antibodies are being looked at right now, and we're trying to figure that out because that will be the true cure, uh, but that's going to take a little bit more time. So I'll stop there and open it up for any questions. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you so much, Dr. Pimentel. I know um, Ramona, for example, a longtime follower of yours and ours, um, is like in her house right now, jumping up and down when you just said that about the um, antibody treatment. As I know so many of us uh, feel that way after taking the TRIO SMART test or not. Can you just describe the TRIO SMART test a little bit more for anyone at home who's like wondering, do I have these antibodies? So, so the IBS smart test, you mean is IBS smart body. test. Sorry, yeah. thanks. So, True smart is the three gas breath test. This is the IBS smart test. Thank you. Yeah. So IBS smart is basically you. The kit gets sent to your house, and then you, or you can get it from a doctor's office or a practitioner's office, and then the blood is drawn. It's sent back to the lab. It it basically just measures these two antibodies and how high they are in your blood, and if they're at a certain level. That's what's causing it. Now, one thing I didn't talk about is that the anti-CDTB antibody tends to go down with time because if you don't get another food poisoning, you don't get that juicing up of the antibody. The problem is antivinculin is you and you always have you. So the anti auto antibody is the one that doesn't go down as much or over time, it takes a longer time, let's say that way. So that's the one we're trying to target to cure IBS. Okay. And uh, when you're saying autoimmunity, I know in the past we've had that specific question, like, is it, a, do you call it an autoimmune disease? And I know the terminology can be so um, confusing if you like hang your hat on something like that. So how do you convey that for all of us who are thinking, wait a minute, does that change the way I should be thinking about this? Yeah. Well, terminology is more political than it is anything else. Um, there, there is a politics to terminology. The irritable bowel syndrome concept, if you think about it, irritable bowel syndrome, the word syndrome means that it has no understanding of cause. Uh, it's just a constellation of symptoms. So by having these tests, IBS really is no longer a syndrome, it's a disease. But that has to be, you know, consensus changed and, and so forth. So, so, um, it's complicated, but yes, I would consider IBS an autoimmune disease if you have these antibodies, absolutely. Okay, great. Allison, you wanna chime in with a question that we pre-talked about? Oh, you're on mute. Oh, you're muted. 
Hi, <laughs> I'm unmuted. Um, yeah, can you give us an update on what is happening with the, the methane specific treatment you had been studying a while ago, SIN10? Yeah, so SIN10, unfortunately, you know, the, it's still lovastatin is the principal component. Lovastatin blocks the F420 enzyme in methane producers. So if you were to pour lovastatin, which is a cholesterol drug, on methane producers, their methane goes down dramatically. Now, trying to get that to the correct parts of the gut was the problem, and, and the design of the product didn't quite do what it was supposed to do. So the trial was not so successful, unfortunately, and we always thank the patients for having participated, but it didn't quite work out the way we hoped. The patients where methane went down, it was a good thing for them, but it didn't always go down related to the drug, and so that was the challenge. So I hate going back to the drawing board. That was three years of work for all of us here, uh, but you know, we have to be intellectually honest, and it didn't work, and we have to figure it out. So that's our challenge. You know, on, uh, on that note, um... We'd had a bunch of people who were getting confused with the new emo terminology. And so I just wanted to ask you about that. And specifically, what seemed to be coming up was people were thinking that it was like a new disease and that we had no treatments for it. So can you just talk to that? Oh, yeah. So basically what we're trying to do, so intestinal methanogen overgrowth is an overgrowth, but it's of those methanogens. We have treatment. I mean, I already showed you a double blind study, rifaximin plus neomycin. So we that works for emo quite well. It's, you know, there, nothing's perfect. So there are patients who still struggle and we need to find better answers. But for a large minor, majority of patients, the rifaximin and neomycin is quite successful. Uh, so we have treatments. We just want to make sure that we're not calling everything SIBO, that we want to be scientifically and intellectually accurate on how we're labeling things, that's all. So I just wanna to say to the community, like to not overthink that because it's not like we, it, it's it, like you said, I think you called it different flavors. I love that part. That um, is a great way to look at it. So sometimes when we get into what I call SIBO panic, um, we're just like really being so literal that it distracts from the, you know, the project at hand, which is to treat it and there are treatments. Um, Talk to us, if you would, about a very hot topic, which is stomach acid, PPI use, et cetera. And if you could explain what a PPI is and just help everybody who has GERD and um, they're sometimes taking HCL supplements and they're getting helped. And other people are like, wait a minute, I thought that was making some of my SIBO slash IMO worse, according to Dr. Pimentel. So I just need clarity for everyone on that, if you would. Yeah, well, there's a lot to say about acid, and and yeah. so um, because a lot of you out there use acid in different ways or block it in different ways, and so many people are on acid blockers. So if you have heartburn, you get on a PPI, which is a proton pump inhibitor, so it blocks acid being secreted into your stomach or uh, to help digest food, and so you stop the acid, the heartburn goes away. But acid is one of the protective mechanisms for bacteria getting into your body. Uh, so you have no acid, you have the chance that what you eat as bacteria gets past that stomach guardian acid and gets into the small intestine. So there was always this belief that, hey, if you take a PPI and the acid's zero, you're going to get SIBO. And uh, we did some breath test studies early on and we said, hey, we're not seeing that. We're not seeing that at all. Um, and then we did the reimagine study and we looked at people on PPI, no PPI, absolutely no difference. What we did see is clostridium goes down with PPI. Now, what does that mean? Well, that means your nice, beautiful, normal clostridium, which are protecting the clostridium neighborhood, are gone. That means C. diff can come in as an interloper. And then you get this C. diff colitis thing, because that's well established in, in PPI use. On the flip side, people are taking acid, uh, you know, apple cider vinegar or other things say, oh, yeah, more acid, kill more bacteria. But on this, on the emo side, methanogens love acid. They love hydrogen. Anywhere hydrogen they can get, they will produce methane. So if you put vinegar, take vinegar or acid as a supplement, 
it's possible that you're going to increase methane. How do I know this? I know this from the PPI story. We saw people on PPIs had less methane. So that means less acid in the gut, less fuel for methane. And so what I don't want you to take away from that is take a PPI to make methane go down. Because that part, we're not quite sure if that's going to work in, in a prospective way. But we did think about adding PPI to lovastatin to help get the lovastatin to be more effective. And it's a work in progress. No, on this uh, PPI front, there are so many uh, patients who feel that they got their SIBO after being on a PPI. Um, you know, just their their sense of things, how they've put it together. Your studies show that we, we really can't make a causal connection. Mm -hmm. Early studies had always listed PPIs as risk factors. So I don't know, what do you have to say, especially to the people who feel that they got it from PPIs? Well, I sort of glazed over one of the slides that I showed, but the question you need to ask yourself is why are you on a PPI? So um, you obviously have a digestive disorder in order to need a PPI. And one of the digestive disorders that leads to reflux potentially is anything that causes pressure in the abdomen. SIBO does that. More gas, more pressure, more reflux potentially, right? So maybe you had SIBO all along and now you're on a PPI. That's one explanation. The other explanation is dyspepsia, we now know, is a post-infectious disorder too and is caused by SIBO. I showed you that with the Australian study that it included IBS and dyspepsia patients, and the treatment for dyspepsia is PPI or commonly used. So it could be that we're mixing things up and not focusing on, well, why did you have a digestive issue to begin with? that you needed the PPI, and maybe it was SIBO all along, and maybe that all came from food poisoning also. So it's, it, I, maybe I'm being confusing, but I'm hopefully- Not at all. Okay. <laughs> so, um, oh wait, tell us what dyspepsia is for somebody who does not know. So dyspepsia Please. is, you feel sort of that raw sensation in your stomach, or you feel heartburn. That's another sort of symptom of dyspepsia. So, can we just talk about hydrogen in general then? Um, a lot of, not a lot, but occasionally I see people saying like, I did my treatment. I did my breath test after the treatment to see how it went. And my, hi, my, my, there's more gas now. Like what the heck, you know, uh, did you see this a lot? And how do you interpret that? I know Dr. C. Becker and Dr. Steven Sandberg Lewis have a name for it. Like, what do you call it? Allison? Pissed off bacteria syndrome or pissed off methanogen <laughs> syndrome if it happens with that. It was just very early on, you know, we saw this and we gave it a fun name. Okay. Yeah, Sometimes so, you just gotta laugh. Yeah. No, we, we see that. Okay, so we see that with methane, for example, you got a methane producer and you know methane's eating four hydrogens to make one methane. You get rid of methane, all of a sudden the hydrogen goes up because, you know, the, the wolves eating the rabbits are no longer there, so the rabbits are going up and you're seeing all the hydrogen. The same thing with hydrogen sulfide. You get rid of the hydrogen sulfide. You didn't know it was there because you didn't have hydrogen sulfide three years ago. And then all of a sudden the hydrogen goes up after antibiotics. I've had patients say, oh, you know, doc, my, my diarrhea is so much better, but we did a breath test and the hydrogen's higher than it was before. Well, that was hydrogen sulfide because now that we have hydrogen sulfide, we're seeing that happening in real time. So it all speaks to, you gotta do all three gases because otherwise you don't understand what you're seeing. And then when you see the hydrogen sulfide go down, the hydrogen go up, you go, oh yeah, um, Mrs. Jones, this is what's happening. Now you can see it on, on the breath test. So the right information helps you make the right explanation. That's sort of what. You know, on that note, can I jump in? <laughs> because yeah, you're just talking it. about the three gases and the hydrogen sulfide. Um, of course, you've identified Fvarium but we're all still anxiously awaiting to hear if there's going to be any other bugs identified for hydrogen sulfide. When can we expect to learn about that? Yeah, so the good news about methane is there's only two characters that are of any importance to methane. And of those two, 90%, it's M. smithii. Super simple story, not simple, wasn't simple to find, but now that it's out there, it's simple. 
Hydrogen sulfide, there's probably 10 or 20 organisms that can produce hydrogen sulfide. It doesn't mean that all of them are involved. For example, many bugs produce hydrogen, but we now know the hydrogen characters that are causing trouble are E. coli and Klebsiella. Many produce hydrogen sulfide, but we're finding two or three characters, which I can't tell you today, uh, are producing hydrogen sulfide and are really the culprits here. Um, but you'll, you'll know soon. It's, it, you know, we're, it's all coming up. Like some publications to be expected. Yes, yes, already done, submitted, so. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> and um, when you were talking about hydrogen earlier in your presentation, the E. coli and the Klebsiella, you were talking about trying to find treatments, drugs, trying to get the drugs to the right location yeah. to handle the E. coli and the Klebsiella. Can you talk about that a little bit? Well, I can't give you a lot of details because that's also coming out later this year, but what I can tell you is that we now know E. coli is, is hiding and uh, it hides from the antibiotics and in particular rifaximin. So we think by getting to them, we get them down. One of the interesting things, and this is something that we're looking into how we can sort of present this, what we see after rifaximin is we don't, you know, you would expect, oh, you took an antibiotic and your microbiome's all going down, including E. coli. It's exactly the opposite. What we see is that the rifaximin kills the E. coli and Klebsiella, and then after the rifaximin is done, you see this beautiful growth of everything that was supposed to be there. And so that beautiful diagram comes back. Uh, and so by getting rid of the bullies, you know, the school is healthier. Well, you know, that just makes me think of the article you, you put out in the fall, which was fascinating about disruptor taxa. And really, that's what you're describing here is that they just disrupt everything. Yeah, get rid of them and, and, and everything just bounces back to a nice, healthy environment. Get rid of global warming and the coral reefs will grow back again. Sorry, I got political. No, it's fine. Feel free. Feel free. Um, that's so exciting. And it's just, you know, this is a message of hope. This is a message of resilience. And that is what yeah, we're so happy to be able to share. And we salute you, Dr. Pimentel, for all of your hard work and your whole team. Um, so please send our love and our best. I'm not wrapping it up. I'm just saying that like, this is exciting times. It's so exciting. I'm just over the moon. And also I think we need to remind ourselves of how incredible our bodies are, right? Like, yeah, absolutely. Amazing. And, and the 22 people working back there. Now God bless them. There's 22 people, that's a lot of people. And so things go faster. So I'm really excited about our new space and the new people. And we got many PhDs who are super smart and, and making me look smart. And, and that that's what they're, they're just fantastic. They're really, really brilliant people back there. Uh, on a on a note about that, if somebody wanted to uh, make a nonprofit donation, is that set up for the mass program for this? Uh, if you just go to my Twitter, there's a there's a I'm, I'm not doing this program for that purpose, but you brought it up. Uh, he so, didn't know I was going to ask him uh, that. Yeah, we, we do have a, a, a link on on my okay. Twitter um, at Mark Pimentel MD. So you, you, but no pressure to do anything like that. That, that is Siobhan Sarna saying go afterwards and donate if you can please even if it's a dollar imagine so um that's just me it wasn't talking didn't talk obviously I didn't talk to dr pimentel about that beforehand but it's so near and dear and um just it takes a village so just wanted i was thinking about the 22 people and how and we could have this incredible domino effect of support we, we have we have an amazing group of small and larger donors that are just making an enormous difference and that enables this so uh we're always grateful for for all the help we get. So thanks for the pitch. My I have more questions. <laughs> yes, we have more questions. I just, I, questions. And by the way, hold on, Allison. If anybody feels like, oh my gosh, you know, you have to leave or something, don't worry. We will be sending the recording out. We will be sending a professional searchable transcript out. Um, and also, at, Every single time that Dr. Pimentel has come on and spoken with me, um, Dr. Seebecker, we have it all in one spot and we're gonna be sending you that link too for free. So you can just watch over time how things have changed. It's very, very exciting. I'd start with this one first though. <laughs> Dr. Seebecker, go ahead. Well, Mark, you had so many fascinating studies come out in, in recent times. And one of them, I think also from the fall, I'm not sure when, 
um, was about methane and heart rate, which was so fascinating that it can uh, shown to decrease heart rate. And you discussed in there that it can have action. Basically, methane can have action on the parasympathetic nervous system and might be affecting the vagus nerve. And the vagus nerve is something so many of our audience are very interested in um, because they're, they're thinking about its connection with the migrating motor complex. And, you know, if, if this connection is there and, um, you know, if the vagus is inhibited and that's leading to inhibited uh, MMC, might that mean we really need to get rid of or, or normalize, not get rid of, normalize the methane gas levels to have a, a positive effect on the vagus nerve? I don't know. Just tell us anything from your study. Yeah. So we, we always knew methane was doing some pro provocative things. And, and of course, we know methane slows the gut down. That's what's doing it. The more methane you have, the more it affects what we call the smooth muscle of the gut. Smooth muscle is the automatic muscle because you don't have to focus on digestion. It's happening for you. But the more methane you have, the more impaired that is. But I'm going to try and compare methane to anesthesia gases. So when you get put to sleep in, for an operation, they often use isoflurane, enflurane, and they used to use halothane. Well, methane, halothane, enflurane, you can tell there's a pattern. They're called hydrocarbons. Hydrocarbons have effects on the smooth muscle of the gut. So when you go under for your gallbladder surgery, your blood pressure changes, your heart rate changes. So we said, well, well maybe methane is associated with that. But guess what? You also fall asleep right? That's what you do when you go under. Well, methane, we think, is also responsible for this part of the brain fog that patients get when they have SIBO, especially those with methane. We see more brain fog there. So it's a hydrocarbon. It gets everywhere, and, and it can have effects, but it slows the heart rate down. That's, that's very clear from that paper, which was really, really interesting. We sort of had a little spin-off of that. We saw actually patients with pacemakers had more methane than patients who didn't didn't put it in the paper because it was a small subset, but um, it's just very interesting. And can you comment any more on the relationship with the vagus nerve? Yeah, so, so hard to test the vagus nerve. There are specific tests. Uh, what we did see is that if you did a pancreatic polypeptide test, it was more often abnormal. Pancreatic polypeptide test, this is really gross, people. So the way you do it is pancreatic polypeptide is a peptide or, or a protein that's released by the pancreas when you're ready to eat. You're thinking about eating, it's already going up. You put food in your mouth, it goes much higher. When it gets into the stomach, the food, then it really goes up. But the way we do the test is we measure in the blood the pancreatic polypeptide level, just fasting, and then after you take food, chew it and spit it out. You don't eat it, you don't swallow it. And that wasn't going up in patients as well with patients with methane. So there's a number of things we're seeing with methane that suggests it's vagus. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So potentially, you know, it's almost like you can get methanogen overgrowth because the MMC isn't working very well. But then once you have it, you're really screwed because then it's potentially limiting the, you know, the movement more. Right, you're exactly right. So basically what, let's talk about the SIBO story. The SIBO story is you got all those antibodies that are causing things to slow down and then you get, that helps the SIBO stay. In the case of methanogens, the methane's slowing everything down to keep the methane bugs staying. Uh, and so it's two sides of a coin, but the, the, the principle is if you can slow it down, we can stay in this home and you know harmony is not reached. So. Uh, and we have to find the middle ground. Wow, that's a lot. Um, a question for you about, um, do you have any tips on how patients can get rifaximin? I know that they have um, a patient's assistance program, but any, any suggestions just to a lot of practitioners are here, a lot of patients are facing a very high cost for the drug? Well, you know, look, what, what I've tried to show today is that IBSD is SIBO and SIBO is IBSD in a lot of overlapping senses. So therefore, it's okay to say it's IBSD and, and it's approved for IBSD. So you, that's the best way to get, if you call it SIBO, back in the day before it got approved, the 
drug comp the drug the pharma um, sorry your insurance companies were saying well we want to make sure it's SIBO before we give you Rifaximin even though it wasn't approved for SIBO now that it's approved for IBS they said well SIBO is not IBS you know so it's it's flipped um, but it is IBS so call it IBS because it is IBS uh, so I, I think I think that's the confusion is that you want to stick with what it's approved for by the FDA which is IBS and so in a sense it's like you have ulcer disease but it's caused by H. pylori, but it's still ulcer disease. So just call it ulcer disease, that's what it is. And then you're more likely to get it uh, approved by your insurance. So even if you have IBSD, get like, it's okay to call it IBSC if your insurance, you know, is that like a suggestion you could make to your doctor? Yeah, that you well, yeah. C, is, C is trickier. So you're, you know, you're not lying uh and being deceptive when it comes to ibsd and the SIBO relationship because they're one and the same Thank you. when it comes to ibsc it gets a little trickier with insurance companies if the insurance company is being stubborn and saying look it's only approved for a, a d why are you taking this that kind of thing but um you know what we often do is we send the insurance company the double blind study and say look there's evidence that it works and usually that does it, um, especially if the doctor's office is receptive to that and, and willing to go the, the extra mile. Right. So. Yep, thank you. So just to clarify for my friend, Michelle, who has IMO and is very focused on this terminology thing, and I understand Michelle, as she is asking, and, and this is a question I was gonna ask anyway, so don't everybody hate me because I can only ask so many questions, but, um, is IMO caused by food poisoning or just SIBO? But you see, it's the same. How can we answer that to people who have that question? So <clears throat> the answer is that we don't see the antibodies elevated very often in C. So <clears throat> connecting food poisoning to constipation, that line is not straight. Connecting food poisoning to SIBO and D, it's a straight line. So I don't routinely measure the antibodies in C, so I would advise you not to do that. It just isn't cost effective because you're not going to see it too often. So that, that's one point to make. So it's not food poisoning there. But the, the real question you're asking is then, then what the heck is it? Uh, and I don't know. Uh, we don't know yet. Why does, methanid, why does methane go up in some patients and other people it's fully nice in the normal location? and and that's a mystery still to solve. Okay, great. And um, this double blind study that you just referred to, I'm going to get so many people emailing me asking which double blind study, <laughs> so we can just help them find it in PubMed. Which which one are you talking about? I'm talking about the one in digestive diseases and sciences. I believe it's 2012. I, I'm one of the authors on it. If you search that way, and you're looking for rifaximin and neomycin, that study. It's a double blind study. Words. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and a couple of people are saying that they just had the doctor say IBS and they're like with no initial next to it and their um, their insurance company approved it along with the coupon from um, the manufacturer of that drug. So just wanted to address that because um, I know that's it's it's a huge question. So I wanted to bring uh, up. Can I bring yeah. up something? Yeah, yeah I wanted to bring up about the. Um, Mark, you and I were talking a little bit about uh, the breath testing substrates because Siobhan and I had just sent out an interview and presentation we did with Dr. Horolak, where he surprisingly found fructose uh, did a very good job of identifying SIBO when done in the style of you know a longer test because typically um, fr fructose substrate tests weren't used for SIBO, mm -hmm. but he did it with you know multiple tubes and, and long time. And he found, um, he found actually glucose was um, not as good uh, as he originally thought. Lactulose was good and fructose was even better. And uh, when I emailed you about it, I thought you had something very interesting to say, which was uh, that that didn't surprise you, but what's hard is convincing people that a positive fructose test can be SIBO, you know? So can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, well, because there's multiple breath tests. Um, what I mean is the breath test is the same, the sugar is different. So for example, back uh, with still, people do lactose breath tests to look for lactose intolerance. It is gonna get a little convoluted, but I'll work with me. Go for it. So lactose intolerance means you drink milk, you get bloated, you have diarrhea. 
That's lactose intolerance. It doesn't mean you don't absorb milk. It doesn't mean you don't digest lactose. Because if you have, the way lactose intolerance works is the milk sugar, which is hard for every human to digest more than glucose, because glucose is super easy, comes in right away. Lactose takes work. Everybody as an adult takes more work to digest lactose. So you almost need your whole small intestine to absorb a glass of milk. That's everybody. But imagine you have overgrowth. Now that milk sugar isn't getting in so fast because it doesn't anyway. And you have bacteria there saying, well, we'll take it first because you didn't get it. And now you have bloating and symptoms. So is that lactose intolerance? Well, sort of, you're having bloating after drinking milk. If you got rid of the overgrowth, you wouldn't have it. You'd absorb it perfectly. So that's the problem with the lactose breath test is because if you have bacterial overgrowth, you're gonna be positive with lactose. Fructose is the same thing. If you drank, I'm not picking on Snapple, but if you drank one Snapple, regular Snapple, not the diet Snapple, or one Coca-Cola, you have enough fructose in there that it exceeds the capacity of most people's digestive tract for fructose. So if you had SIBO, you're going to have symptoms from it. If you, if you don't have SIBO, you won't. And, and, and hence, the breath test will be positive with fructose if you have SIBO. So in the North American consensus, we didn't call it fructose specifically, but we said if you're going to do lactose breath testing for lactose intolerance, you should first check for SIBO, because if you have SIBO, it's going to be false positive. The question is, why is fructose even more provocative than lactulose? The reason for that is fructose is much easier for bacteria to digest. Lactulose is a synthetic sugar, and not all the bacteria know how to do it. So it's going to be even maybe better in some ways for picking up SIBO. But the problem is you don't know if you have fructose intolerance or SIBO. Whereas with lactulose, you know, humans don't digest it at all. So it's more clear. So we prefer lactulose over fructose. So that was clear as clear as mud, right? It was great. <laughs> Great. Yeah, because you know you have secondary, basically secondary lactose or fructose intolerance when you have SIBO yeah. very often. Yeah. Thank you for for talking about that because I know it's a, on people's minds since we just sent that out. And when you clear the SIBO, you see those intolerances improve, right? Often, a, but the, the problem. So yes. So <clears throat> if you clear SIBO, all of a sudden people drink milk, or we do another lactose breath test, and it's perfectly normal. The problem is all that sugar getting down there, if you have that antibody and the gut's not moving well, it's just fuel for bringing the fire back. So we generally tell people to avoid lactose so that the SIBO doesn't come back quickly. On their, on their like post-treatment prevention, SIBO prevention diet. Right. Yeah. So therefore the role of prokinetics is still very important for everybody. Yeah, you know, prokinetics, we, we did one study where we checked how prokinetics work and they can delay it by two to three fold, um, depending on which prokinetic you use. Because it's, after all, IBS and SIBO are a motility problem and trying to keep the motility going is, is key. It's the river, I, I, I often use this analogy, if you ever watch those Survivor Man or survival shows well, on TV, no. right? No. They yeah. drink water from the rapid flowing stream because that's clean. They don't drink it from the stagnant water. So the small bowel should be a nice rapid flowing stream and that keeps it nice and clean. Well, on that food poisoning thing, the question that so many people always have is, um, we talk about bacterial, uh, pathogenic bacteria like Campylobacter causing it, but people always wonder, can parasites cause it? Can parasites do the same thing and I cause it? I found out a very cool thing. You know who has a ton of vinculin? Giardia. It's part of Giardia. So the question, which hasn't been answered yet, can Giardia cause anti-vinculin antibodies? And I wonder, yes, because a lot, of, a lot of these parasites are more closely linked to our cells in the sense that they have those, those proteins. What's amazing about vinculin is that it must be a super important protein because no matter where you look it's identical 
if you go to rats, if you go to uh, parasites, if you go to uh, all sorts of, no matter what level, vinculin is vinculin, always the same. Uh, and so um, it's an important protein. And I guess Campylobacter hijacked it. Oh. Yeah, Campylobacter and the other, hmm. the other bacteria. And are there any other parasites that we know of that can lead to this, to SIBO and IBS? Well, I think, so if you, if you look, there are Trichinella spiralis is a model of IBS that's been developed in Canada, another parasite, uh, sort of pig worm. Uh, it, there's a number of parasites that could, but they're so uncommon in the U.S. that mm. you don't have good tracking. Uh, it's a little difficult to, to show the association. But the two that are well known are Trichinella and, and Giardia. And Giardia is not, not uncommon at all. <laughs> no, it's not. Exactly. exactly. And, and what about um, viral? I mean, we know that um, food poisoning and well, you know, acute gastroenteritis is so common from viruses. And that's the other thing people always wonder about. Could yeah, it, I mean, there are, are publications that show that, but if you if you look at virus, the chance of developing food poisoning is way, way lower. Um, and even when you look at the four bad actors, E. coli, Salmonella, Shigella, and Campylobacter, a lot of pathogenic E. coli that cause food poisoning, not all of them have CDTB toxin. So that's why if you get E. coli, you're less likely to get IBS than if you get Campylobacter, where they all have CDTB. <clears throat> so the ranking is Campylobacter is the worst, Salmonella is second, Shigella is third, and E. coli is the least likely to develop IBS. Um, and that's sort of how we how we see it. What thank about, um, can I just pop in, Allison? We uh, yeah, I'm just saying thank you. That's great. Oh, you did okay. it. <laughs> three minutes. What about Alinea for um, treatment of... IBS, IMO, SIBO. Do, have you thought? I'm sure you've thought of it. Have you played around with that at all? Uh, I mean, I occasionally use it. I, you have to go with what works for the patient. Not every patient responds to Rifaximin, so I have used it occasionally. One of the challenges there, just maybe more of a challenge than even Rifaximin, is it's not approved for that, and it's even more expensive in some cases than than Rifaximin. So that's the challenge with Alinea. But it, it's basically, it's nitazoxanide. So it's, it's similar to flagyl or metronidazole. Um, and we hadn't found that metronidazole to be very effective in SIBO, maybe 25% effective compared to 40 to 60% with rifaximin. So, um, but not, not a lot of good studies yet. Okay. So uh, the thing is, is that rifaximin, uh, does it provide those long-term benefits that we're looking for or just that short-term relief? Like, you know, should we expect if we do have the antibodies to, until we find the cure, um, just to like pulse it? Is that, does that seem reasonable? So rifaximin is approved as a pulse. So uh, okay. you take it and if you relapse, you can take it again. And, and then a third time, that's how it's approved. But what we don't know yet, and we're, we're, we think, is that when the vinculin antibodies are at their highest, the highest levels, those patients, rifaximin works, but for a very short time, because the motility is so badly damaged. But I, I'm, I can tell you, I see people at the mall, and they said, you treated my SIBO three years ago, I'm still great, I feel fantastic. Those people, their antibodies aren't high, are, aren't high at all. So, and, and it's always a pleasure to see them and glad that the one and done, because oh, we have one and awesome. done. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, there are one and done, so there's- There are. Um, and then how does C. diff play a role in this? Is that, that's not a food poisoning potential cause, right? Oh. You've already established that. So, but, and rifaximin doesn't lead to C. diff, right? Uh, oh, rifaximin, rifaximin can kill C. diff. So it's actually been shown to be almost as effective as vancomycin. So for C. diff, which is the ultimate treatment short of fecal transplant, there's a, there's a couple of new drugs too, but it's vancomycin is one of the staples of C. diff treatment and rifaximin works as well. For some reason, the drug company never continued to pursue the C. diff indications. So it's sort of, it is what it is. But it's we not an underlying so cause like the other ones are, as you have indicated in your maps. Right. Okay. We have something so important to say as we end here. You have a book coming out. <laughs> Please tell us. It comes out April 12th. So it's the, uh, you know, people have been saying, do another book because there's so many updates. Just 
tons of updates. Uh, and so we finally did another book and, and it's coming out and we're hopeful it will help more people. You know, the, the problem is my clinic is so packed. People, we don't, we can't take new patients. So we have to figure out ways to help all the people that are out there and the doctors. The book is, uh, you know, technical enough. Doctors would find a lot of valuable information there. So, but it's, uh, like my lecture, I, I'm telling you, you're, you have a very sophisticated audience. Some of you may be patients, some of you may be practitioners, but I use the same slides. You just, it's all in the explanation. You can understand this. This is not, it's, it's complicated to get where we are, but now that we are where we are, it's not that complicated. And so um, hopefully the book will help a lot of people who maybe don't have the doctor that understands this or maybe they can hand it to that doctor so we'll what is see. the name exactly. what is the name it's of your called book? the microbiome connection and Excellent. so it's coming out um if you look at pimentel and microbiome connection you'll see it we can get it on pre-order amazon or yeah it's on pre it's already yeah. ready for pre-order so that that'll be that's already live and, and we put a link well, up for it in the chat go ahead yeah i already ordered mine ibs awareness month april that's when we're coming out i love it Perfect timing. I'm so please, congratulations and congratulations on all of this amazing. Seriously, it, we have to let you go because you know I, I always am true to my word about your timing. Thank you so much, guys. Chime into the chat with some love for Dr. Pimentel. Keep him in your thoughts and prayers along with his entire team. Dr. Pimentel, bless you. We'll have you back when the book is out to do some promo for it. Can't wait. And thanks. Send our best to everybody. Thank you. Great seeing you both and great Thank audience. You. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, bye. everybody. We're, Alice and I will stay on for a second. We'll say bye to Dr. Pimentel. Bye, Dr. Pimentel. <laughs> bye. So you guys can um, chime in and just send that love. We're just sending it out into the universe. Okay. Sending um, all the good vibes. Bye, I'm doctor. Bye-bye. Okay. See ya. Well, that was deeply rewarding, Allison. <laughs> So great to hear all the news. Again, so many tantalizing hints of what's what's going to be I coming know. out in the near future, right? You know, treatments know. for hydrogen sulfide that they've been testing, the bugs that are causing hydrogen sulfide, treatments for hydrogen that, you know, getting drugs getting to the right location, uh, the fact that hydrogen isn't feeding the methanogens. Uh, I mean, E. coli, sorry, not uh, E. coli isn't the bug making the hydrogen that's feeding into the methanogens in emo, like a lot of things I have not heard him talk about yet. So yeah. a lot of new things. It's very exciting. Thanks for joining me, Allison. I really appreciate it. I always love your insights and enthusiasm and questions. Uh, yes, everyone's getting the recordings. And when you click on uh, another link, we're gonna also provide you in the email. Um, you'll be able to go back and see all of the things that we have done with Dr. Pimentel over five years. That's a long time. That's a long time. You'll see um, the progression, but like I said, start with this one, re-listen to this one, um, go back and check the, the area, the links that we're gonna send you tonight. Um, over the next, give us a few days to get the transcript done. Um, I'm, I don't know if we're going to resend the transcript. Just know that the link that we're going to send you shortly will have um, the transcript added to it. Um, it depends on a couple of things, whether or not we'll send the, that second email. But uh, thank you very much. If you're, if you are in the Facebook group and you're not already on our email list, go to SIBOinfo.com and get on Dr. Seebecker's email list and go to SIBOSOS.com and get on my email list. So you don't miss the thing because we are cranking and we have so much cool stuff coming down the pike to share with you so that you will be able to be that empowered patient, that empowered practitioner if you are interested in becoming a SIBO pro, Dr. Seebecker created a SIBO professional course called SIBO pro. You can find it on our site and mine. And then if you're a patient and you're wondering how to navigate all this, certainly join us in the SIBO recovery roadmap course. That is a great option as well. Also on both sites. Okay. Thanks, Dr. Seebecker. Thank you so much. Bye everyone. Happy Valentine's Bye, everyone. Day. <laughs> yeah. Big hugs. Bye Clarissa. Thanks for your help. Okay, my team is going to go and work on getting you out um, the, the video, and then we will be working on the transcript diligently. Know that they are searchable, so um, we cannot provide the slides. You know I usually do that, 
However, um, the policies at Cedar Sinai are that those slides are not to be shared. So, um, Eric Hamilton, I love you, man. Sorry. Um, so I um, just want to address that expectation um, right now. You know, I also love to do Q and A, so I, you know, usually just crank through those. But today it was really about hearing the rest of the story from Dr. Pimentel. So um, bless you all. Thank you so much. And um, oh. Ooh, ooh, fun. Don't forget, you can get my book too, Healing SIBO. By the way, you don't make a lot of money in books, so it's not like I'm like getting rich and going to Hawaii off the book. That's not the point. That isn't why I wrote it. But a lot of the foundation and the protocols are in the book. It's like 20 bucks on Amazon. And so this could hold you over until Dr. Pimentel's book comes out. It's called Healing SIBO. All right. I'm going to wrap it up. Thank you. Okay. Bye, everyone. Thanks so much. I'm going to wrap this so that my team can be released to work on getting the information to you via email. Um, will you be able to see the slides in the replay? You'll be able to see the slides in the replay, just like we're not downloading them. And um, because we just don't have access to them because they're his proprietary work, which we understand. Okay. Peace. Thanks, everyone.